it's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. It is the Tuesday, September 5th edition of the show. I am your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. We have got a lot to discuss in the world of winning cures, everything in the world of college football. Hopefully, all of you had a wonderful Labor Day weekend. Everybody got to barbecue, everybody got to grill out, all that good stuff. I'm hoping that it was the best for you from a gambling perspective as well. So, let's uh, let's go ahead and talk about some of the big things. I went 3-0 and on BetUS TV's new show, Three Dog Thursday, with... Old TJ Reeves, those of you that have listened to this show for a very long time or have watched the show for a long time, TJ, the sideline reporter for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, he has a podcast called Three Dog Thursday. We have turned it into a game show over on BetUS TV, and I went 3-0 and against Brian Edwards, of course, the handicapper from Vegas Insider. Uh, he went 1-2. and two. I went 3-0. and oh. I will continue on this week picking underdogs again. So I had Arizona, I had West Virginia, and I had uh, somebody else. I can't remember who it was. Florida. That's who it was. So uh, 3-0 and against the number. Not too shabby. Uh, go ahead and tell you all that uh, I- I'm very appreciative of those that listen from other countries. Winning Cures Everything is now in the top 200 football podcasts in Canada, Germany, Mexico, and Turkey. I had no idea. But you guys are awesome. You can reach out to me anytime. Email me, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or you can also hit me up on Twitter, at GaryWCE. Uh, shout out to our top six biggest markets. Uh, we had two that were very, very close at number five. Uh, but we've got Atlanta, Chicago, Birmingham, Los Angeles, Houston, and Dallas. And you guys are awesome for watching and listening to the show for sure. Uh, Make sure that I want to shout out the contest, the picks contest. Seth won week ones, but but you can win week two. The lines are already up. You go over to winningcureseverything.com, click on the contest part right there, and it is easy to click the link and go ahead. This is brought to you by BetUS. Of course, the show is powered by BetUS. It is America's premier online sports book. Go and check it out. They are, in fact, where the game begins. You can go there for all of your sports gambling needs. Now, again, we've got a lot to get into. Uh, but yes, go sign up for the Pick'em Contest. There is a link in the description for that. There's a link in the description for BetUS. It, the description has all the stuff that you need. <laughs> we'll just make it very, very easy. All right. Let's go ahead and dive into topic number one. Of course, we had a show last Thursday. We had a show on Sunday, but we did not get to talk about the news from Friday, and that is the college football playoff field is expanding to 12. It is final. It is done. The university presidents have told the commissioners this is being done. We are moving to 12, period, And they are rolling along with the plan that Greg Sankey and Bob Bowlesby and Craig Thompson and Jack Schwarbrick all decided on that they all came to terms with the 12-team format that has six automatic qualifiers, eh, uh, which is the six highest-rated conference champions, and then six at-large bids. Now, we kind of assumed or thought at some point that, uh, you know, we would get to a part where... uh, all of the all of these conferences would be in a lot of trouble because why would the Big Ten, why would the SEC, if they're expanding, they're bringing in these huge, huge brand names, why would they ever sign on to anything that has automatic qualifiers? Well, we sometimes forget that the commissioners are not the end-all, be-all when it comes to this. The university presidents are the ones that are in charge of this, and they are the ones that decided we are going to have the six highest-rated conference champions. There are 10 conferences. You could reasonably go to a format that has all 10 conference champions and then six wild cards to move to 16. There's no reason to do that because typically there's about four of these conference champions uh, out of the 10 
that probably don't deserve to be anywhere near a playoff, but that is why they are keeping the bowl games in lockstep, right? Everything's going the same along with that. But as far as the university presidents go, Mark Keenum, the president of the univer excuse me, of Mississippi State University, uh, he's the one that was basically at the forefront of this. He was the speaker. He was the public voice for this. And he said, we were going to get this done. Part of the reason, now he didn't say this publicly, but they're leaving a ton of money on the table. Uh, Bob Thompson, former Fox Sports president, has been on Twitter saying he thinks that once this thing goes to market, they're going to get about $2.2 billion annually for these 11 games. That is absurd money. Uh, but they are going to get a ton of money for it. That is one thing. So obviously they want this thing done by 2024. We'll see if they can get it done. Uh, 2025 probably seems more reasonable because they had already come to, they had already agreed to contracts with the sites in 2025 and 2026, right? That's January 20. So the 2024 season, 2025 season. Uh, they had already come to contracts with different sites, and that would be Atlanta and Miami. And it's kind of tough to move that stuff around because you're going to have to push this thing back further into January, it appears. We'll see. But uh, very, very interesting how they're doing this. Uh, the reason why the university presidents would want this done and why they would want six uh, automatic conference champions in this thing is because uh, they are looking to slow down expansion. I don't think that the university presidents really want to keep this thing going. Uh, just to guess on this, but that's certainly what it looks like. They want to give everybody a shot at the table. They want, and and of course, you're also trying to avoid lawsuits, right? That's another big part of this. You got to avoid uh, getting taken to uh, court over this for for not allowing access, right? So we'll see what ends up happening. Uh, the other question here, uh, you know, we talked about the market value being two point two billion dollars. The other part of this is, can Fox get involved before 2026? We brought this on last week when we talked about uh, the show on Thursday. The idea is that uh, if you're ESPN and you want Oklahoma and Texas to come on in earlier and you're trying to negotiate with CBS and you're trying to negotiate with Fox over getting the SEC out of their deal early and the Big 12 wants their stuff done quicker and blah, blah, everybody wants something. So you're working on deals. Well, an ESPN property that Fox would really like to be a part of right now is that college football playoff. If you end up having a ton more games before the end of the contract, you might could maybe swap a few things around and let Fox get involved with this thing before. Right now, obviously, if you're ESPN, you don't want to give up the exclusivity. You probably keep the national championship, all that. But the other games will get a ton of viewers as well. So that's why that would go along. Let's uh, let's jump over here. Ross Dellinger uh, talked about it quite a bit. And he, he great article over at Sports Illustrated. Uh, he said the 12-team format, same model proposed 15 months ago by three commissioners, Ants Warwick. Uh, they were part of a CFP working group that spent two years creating the expansion proposal. The model grants automatic bids to the six highest-ranked conference champions, gives first-round buys to the highest-ranked four champions, and completes the field with six at-large selections. First-round games between seeds 5 through 12 are expected to be played on campus or at a location designated by the, uh, by the better seed. A rotation of six bowls will host quarterfinals and semifinals. Uh, and, of course, you can go and check out the model here over on Ross's Twitter page. Uh, and it goes through. I'm not going to read all of it, but it's... It's interesting. The four highest-ranked conference champions assigned to quarterfinal games in bowls, the opponent from first-round game winners, will be assigned by the selection committee based on the bracket. The four highest-rated conference champions are going to get the buys. So if you win a conference championship, you are going to get a buy. Which means that last year, Georgia would have had to have played in week one. They would have hosted a playoff game. And then they would have had to go, and we'll we'll bring this up over at CBS Sports. Uh, They have what a 12-team field would look like in each of the last eight seasons. That is all the different years of the college football playoff. Very interesting to go and look because Georgia, if they had beaten Pitt last year, which I would assume they would, then they would have to go and play Baylor before they would go and play Alabama, which they would not have met in the national title game based on this, right? So the seeding will be different. Uh, When you look at, you know, 2020, 
you would have gotten Indiana and Iowa State and Coastal Carolina in the college football playoff. Like, that is huge for those brands. Uh, You move to 2019, Memphis, Utah, Penn State, Wisconsin, Baylor in there again. Uh, You move to 2018, Penn State, LSU, Florida at the bottom, Washington, UCF, Michigan, Georgia, Notre Dame, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, You move to 2017, it's the same thing. UCF, Washington, Miami, Penn State, USC would have had a seat at the table at this point. Auburn, Wisconsin, Alabama. Uh, You're moving on and on and on. I mean, it is really interesting to to look at. 2016, you would have gotten Western Michigan and Colorado in this thing. Like, Think about how big that is for these brands. I mean, it's just massive to think about. Iowa would have gotten in back in. And, and yes, going to bowl games and whatnot is a big deal. But also, when you can make it into a college football playoff, this is effectively an NCAA tournament, right? There are programs in college basketball that hang banners for NCAA tournament appearances. When you are a college football program and you can say that you have been one of the top 12 in the sport, yeah, you you get to a playoff game. It doesn't matter necessarily how it ends. Uh, will it be as great as winning a bowl game? No. If you get trashed in the first round of the playoff, yeah, that's going to suck. But uh, it's still a big, shiny thing to put in your stadium to help you recruit, to help your fan base believe that there's hope, etc. Right? It's it's a huge, huge deal. So uh, go over to CBS Sports Take a look at uh, at their articles on it. Go read Ross Dellinger stuff, etc. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. Let's talk about the games that have happened over the last couple of nights here. Florida State on Sunday night. Do not get it twisted by the way that that game ended, that there was anything other than domination by Florida State. They almost found a way to give the game away, but this is a learning situation, I would say, for Florida State. Uh once, once you got past a certain point in this game, uh, they took control, and they were, I mean, they were right on top of it. I mean, their their win percentage at one point, even at the end of the game, when it came down to uh, LSU scoring uh, that touchdown, I mean, it, it, Florida State's win probability at that point was still seventy seven percent. I mean, it's based on on what they did in this game. Uh, yeah. They, they had dominated this thing. Um, and dominated may be a strong word. They just looked like the significantly better team overall when, when you look at all the different stats, et cetera. Uh, and that's based on, like, first half through the third quarter, et cetera. Fourth quarter, you go up 24 to 10. I don't know what their defense was doing at that spot. Uh, good gracious. I mean, just tried tried to give it away. Uh, but Mike Norvell was, was right in going about it at the end of the game the way that he did, about fighting, about uh, finding a way to win, all that kind of stuff. He, he was right. They blocked a the field goal early. They blocked an extra point late. Uh, LSU muffed two punts. And, by the way, muffed two punts, and and Florida State didn't score on either of them? I mean, it's just mind-blowing stuff, uh, what, what they were doing in the red zone. But regardless, it's kind of the the old adage of, you lose big, then you lose small, then you win small, and then you win big. Well, we're, I think, at the win small level. Uh, but this thing, I mean, this defensive line looks legit. The offensive line, a lot better than I assume they would be based on uh, the past five, six years, however, however long it's been, four or five years. Uh, it's been pretty, pretty bad. Uh, moving over to the LSU side, uh, got to figure out what in the world is going on with Kayshawn Butte uh, because. He didn't get a lot of touches in this game. He did have a drop in this game. Um, he was he was not happy. He has scrubbed all of his LSU stuff off of his Instagram, which apparently is a really big deal these days. I'm curious. And Malik Neighbors did the same thing. He he muffed two punts. Um, and Brian Kelly's comments afterwards about Malik Neighbors. I mean, sometimes it's better to not say anything at all. Like him coming out publicly and saying all this stuff about. Uh, yeah, you know, you evaluate a player for four weeks over camp and you think, you know, what's, you know, obviously that's on us and we didn't, it still, like, you you come out and you say something positive. You don't say something about, like, I never should have had the kid in. Uh, it's just 
ridiculous the way that he uh, went about that. But, I mean, obviously, first game, we're still trying to figure stuff out here. But, whew, um, Florida State, I mean, found a way to get it done. They, they, were, they were the better team. Uh, and you could tell, like, it, there was more continuity. It was better overall. Uh, but, man... Florida State, you fumble that ball at the one-yard line. You let LSU drive it 99 yards uh, in the last minute and 20, and then you get saved by blocking an extra point. Uh, I mean, you got lucky. You got lucky. You hate to see Mason Smith go out on a a celebration injury, I guess you could say. Uh, Torn ACL, he's out for the year. Uh, The neighbor stuff. I want to know what's up with Keishon Butte. That's what I want to know. That's that's my biggest thing to take out of this game right now is – uh, you gotta you gotta get that guy in the fold, man. We, you got to figure out what in the world is happening there. Uh, we'll move on to the game on Monday night. Clemson forty one, Georgia Tech ten, um, and I know that Clemson did not want this to be the uh, the thing that you take out of it, but Cade Klubnick at the end of that game looked like a seasoned vet. Everything that he did looked better than what DJ Uyangalele did, which is, like, you hate that, but also, I mean, you get it, right? I mean, it's just, uh, that offense was questionable at best early. Uh, Eventually, DJ did look better, right? As you went through, you could see, and you can see this on on here, Cade, I mean, my gosh, uh, EPA per play for Cade was uh, .98. EPA per play for DJ was .09. That's a massive difference. And yes, it is an incredibly small sample size. But, whew, it looked completely different. Looked completely different. Um, They ran more plays for DJ Uyangalele in the running game than they did Will Shipley. And I don't get that. Uh, you got to find a way to get your best players the ball. Shipley only got one target uh, in, you know, receiving. He only had 10 rushes for 42 yards. Let me check and make sure that that's right. Shipley, 10 carries, 42 yards, and had one catch and one target. Will Shipley is one of the top three players on this offense. I mean, what are we doing here? I could not figure out Clemson's game plan. Uh, when you go in and look, here's the biggest thing, and you can see it on the screen here. This is from the ESPN box score. Uh, this is Georgia Tech throws an interception on the first play of the game, then three and out with a punt for Clemson, four plays and a fumble for Clemson, uh, three plays and a punt for Clemson, three plays and a punt, four plays and a touchdown, but that's on a five-yard field uh, because you blocked a you blocked a punt, um, Georgia Tech misses a field goal, and then finally the offense. Once you get towards you know the end of the second quarter, goes eight plays, eighty seven yards uh, or sixty seven yards, excuse me, and then of course they they punt again before the end of the half. Uh, it is Clemson scored five touchdowns on fourteen drives. One of those why uh, was by Klubnik late in the game. Uh, one of them was a five-yard drive. Another one, let's see, there's a field goal. There's a, da, 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 there you go. Touchdown, four plays, 15 yards. So 14 of those 41 points were just handed to you. There are still offensive issues at Clemson. We will say that. George Deck, uh, pretty bad. I mean, just looked, looked really bad. Uh, I, I don't know... I don't even know what to say. Uh, 237 yards. And, and yes, part of this is the fact that Clemson's defense is light years ahead of them. right? Their defense is awesome. But, man, uh, this was bad. It, it, at the same time, Georgia Tech still. This game was 14-10 to 10 in the third quarter. Georgia Tech still had opportunities. They just didn't quite have the dudes. So, Jeff, Seem, uh, Jeff Sims wasn't bad. Uh, 23 out of 36 for 164 yards, one touchdown, one pick. Uh, ran the ball 13 times, 41 yards. Like, he, you know, he's all right. But, man, this is a rough, rough stretch for Georgia Tech. I will tell you that. Rough stretch. Uh, another couple of things to hit on quickly here. Chris Rodriguez 
not going to be back with Kentucky. Of course, Kentucky also has some running back injury issues. But uh, I found this tweet very interesting. Uh, Mark Stoops says he doesn't have anything to report regarding the status of running back Chris Rodriguez. Says he has, quote, been advised not to. And also says it is out of my hands. Uh, it says this is a school issue. It sounds like Kentucky will head to Florida without Rodriguez. Uh, the, this is a school issue with Kentucky regarding Rodriguez. And and I think some other guys. Uh, Trey Wallace, of course, continues on. Uh, Stoop says Ramon Jefferson will be out for several weeks. Running back room, of course, uh, taking a few hits before the Florida game. Uh, I mean, it, it's been announced for a while that he's going to be out for the first two games, at least. At least. But what in the world could be going on that would require university issues? Because this, I don't think this has anything to do with the DUI uh, from before. I I think something else is going on here. Um, so, I mean, we'll see. We will see. Uh, next topic that I want to hit on right quick. Sam Hartman is officially back. Wake Forest starting quarterback Sam Hartman has been medically cleared to return to competition by the school's media experts, uh, or medical experts, excuse me. He was expected to start Saturday at Vanderbilt. He was sidelined August 10th with a non-football-related medical condition. And apparently, the medical condition, from everything that I have read, was uh, some sort of blood clot. Now, apparently there's no more clotting. Everything is flowing the way it should be. He is back in the fold. Uh, what I'm curious about, you know, Wake plays against Vanderbilt this weekend. I'm curious what the rust factor is like because I don't believe that he's been out there practicing with this clot issue. That means that it's almost a month, or it will be a month on Saturday since he got pulled off the field. How does he feel? How, what is the chemistry like? You know, he and A.T. Perry have played together for a very long time. What What's the situation look like? That's what I'm curious about. I want to know what's going on as far as the rust. All right, let's hit some ads. I got uh, NFL gambling picks on the other side. I've got uh, most valuable college football players of the week, the most watched college football games of the week, etc. cetera. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit of hot seat as well before the viewing guide later. All right, let's go on and hit it. Knock it out. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and BetUS TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the BetUS TV College Football Channel. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, let's go ahead and dive into uh, some other interesting things here. The top five most valuable college football players from a PPA perspective. Uh, and that's it, players of the week, basically. We're going to start with the P5s. Uh, Janae Jenkins, wide receiver for LSU, is number one there. Uh, Arizona wide receiver Jacob Cowing, number two. Number three is Kentucky's Tavion Robinson, which I had a feeling he would be since he's replacing Wandale. But, uh, yeah, really, really, really good opening week for him. Number four, Texas tight end uh, Jatavian Sanders. Uh, kind of surprised at that, but obviously Jal- uh, Jalil Billingsley is out for uh, six weeks. So, And then uh, number five, Wake Forest wide receiver Taylor Marin. Uh, he was awesome. He was awesome. All right, let's move over to the G5 here. Number one, Liberty uh, Demarius Douglas, or Demario Douglas, excuse me. Number two, Tulsa's Malachi Jones. Number three is SMU's Rasheed Rice. Number four, Ohio, James Bostick. Uh, yeah, Ohio shocked me this weekend. Shocked me. 
uh, with how effective their passing game was. I mean, it, the wide receiver there, Bostic, was awesome. FAU's uh, Jaquan Burton, he was awesome as well. That's number five there. Uh, the most watched CFB games of the week. Now, everybody, I say everybody, there is a faction of my audience that really seems to enjoy television ratings, etc. It was Labor Day weekend. Today is Tuesday. Uh, I'm recording eh, a little early. And I say a little early. It's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The ratings have not fully come out from the college football weekend yet. So, still waiting on those. But I will tell you some of the numbers that we got. Uh, Notre Dame and Ohio State, 8.42 million viewers on average. Florida State and LSU, the overnight numbers, 6.34 million on that one. And then, of course, we do have the Thursday night numbers. West Virginia Pitt got 3.15 million viewers on average. And Penn State and uh, Purdue, 3.65 million viewers. Those were, of course, overnight numbers. Once we get the actual ones, uh, I'll, tr- I'll probably try and hit on them on Thursday. But going forward, those numbers will come out on Monday. I'll talk about them on the Tuesday show. Easy enough to do. Easy enough. Uh, let's do let's do a little hot seat talk. Hot seat after week one. Now, this is a little bit ridiculous, and I know that, but there are some coaches that maybe need to take a look at what's going on, maybe need to start checking out the housing market, you know, all, all these kind of different things, because, man, some of them took it on the chin on Saturday. Uh, we'll start off with Louisville. Scott Satterfield, who I thought was safe. Mm, you put up many more of those, and you might be in some trouble. I mean, just serious trouble. Uh, that is, that was rough. 31-7 to at Syracuse. Uh, had five drives that got inside the opponent's 40-yard line. Only scored a touchdown on one of them. Uh, Mistakes, turnovers. I'm curious what they will look like going to UCF. But if you get blasted at UCF, there might be some problems. There ain't no recruiting ranking in the planet or on the planet that will be able to save your job if you start going out and laying duds. Uh, Especially when you got a guy like Malik Cunningham, who was a stud last year, right? That's, That's the biggest thing. Nebraska, I've got them on here, of course. I don't think that this win over North Dakota did anything to quell the anticipation or the anxiety around Scott Frost, right? I don't think that solved anything. West Virginia, uh, just a, I mean, week one, like fourth and one in plus territory, and you punt the ball, uh, don't play scared. Like, go out and get the win. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So, regardless, uh, Charlotte, they have, I've got some questions about Charlotte. Now, they do get their quarterback, Chris Reynolds, back. Uh, everybody loves Will Healy. But you go out and lose to William and Mary, uh, and not just lose, but like kind of get blasted, forty-one to twenty-four. Uh, that game wasn't really close. I mean, that's just that's just bad. Carl Durrell at Colorado is another one that you might want to start taking a look at. I picked Colorado to go zero and twelve this year, but this is the third year for him. Like when you see guys like Mike Norvell, who was hired in the same cycle, Norvell starting to you know he got a signature win here against LSU. Granted, it was a bad LSU team, but you're in your third year, and Sonny Dykes comes in at TCU and just wipes the pavement with you uh, at home on a Friday night. Not good. Just not good. Um, we, I think we might have an anxiety bowl uh, this weekend. Memphis versus Navy. And I, I don't know. I mean, maybe people feel the same way that I do, but there could be... There could be some anxiety around this one between Ryan Silverfield and Ken Neomatalola because I, I mean, he, one of those is going to start 0 and 2. And those two programs are not used to that at this point. Like, I know Navy's had a couple of losing seasons here and there, but man, uh, in Memphis, like, Memphis is trying to get into one of the big leagues. Like, they're trying to get to the Big 12, trying to get, you know, one of these bigger conferences. They're trying to, to work their way up. You can't do that. By, by going out and getting blasted at Mississippi State and then going on the road and losing to Navy. I mean, the same Navy team that just lost to Delaware. So that, that's an anxiety bowl situation there. San Diego State, Brady Hoke, of course, there's all the off-field stuff, but you did just get beat at home by three touchdowns by Arizona in the brand-new opening of your your new on-campus stadium, Snapdragon Stadium, right? You, you can't... Ugh, just rough. Uh, South Florida... 
Like, everybody thought Jeff Banks might be able to turn this thing around. The spread on that game against BYU at home was, what, 12 and a half opened, and then it closed at 11 or 11 and a half, uh, and BYU smoked them. That one is rough. So, uh, Je- what did I say? Jeff Banks, Je- Jeff Scott, Jeff Scott, uh, the former Clemson offensive coordinator. Texas State, Jake Spavital, issues, issues. You can't go on the road and lose like that. I mean... Nevada is not a good football team, but they are if you give them the football four times and let them score off. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, Willie Taggart went on the road with FAU and lost at Ohio, and that was a dreadful Ohio team last year. Uh, But Ohio made them look foolish in that game. Now, part of it was turnovers, et cetera, but Willie Taggart, you got to do better. North Texas, uh, Seth Luttrell, again, they are moving into the AAC, but... uh, your soon-to-be rival in the conference is SMU, and SMU just beat them with a first-year head coach, forty-eight to ten. I mean, just beat them like a drum. Uh, and then maybe, maybe we start questioning this just a little bit. Um, the last one I wrote down was Boise State. If Andy Avalos cannot get this offense fixed, uh, I don't know that the boosters at Boise State, and yes, there are boosters there. I don't know how happy they are going to be with him. Uh, I mean, we've seen coaches get fired quickly at other schools, and it's not that Avalos is awful. I mean, obviously, he's done some good things, but, man, you go out on national television to Oregon State and get beat the way that they did, uh, that's a problem. That's a problem. He, he, I would highly recommend to him to make sure that you get your offense in order. Because uh, that'll be, I mean, that's the first thing. That's the first thing you got to look at. All right, let's let's uh, let's hit some picks right quick here. NFL Super Contest Gambling Picks Week Number 1. Yes, this is a college football show. I went 48 and 41 last year against the number in my Super Contest Picks. That is five NFL bets every single season. I'm not going to cover the NFL much here, uh, much if at all. But I am going to give out some picks every week, five picks, because I do enjoy betting on the NFL. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you what I'm betting every week. I bet five games. I bet 10 bucks on each game. I just let it ride. Very easy to do. Uh, the picks that I have for this week, of course, these are all brought to you. The lines are all brought to you by BetUS. It is where the game begins, America's premier online sports book. Go ahead and check out BetUS.com. Game number one. Uh, the Bills are heading to the Rams, of course, on Thursday night. So I guess it's good that we're doing the show on Tuesday. Um, Rams, 5-0 and against the spread in Week 1. Yes, I know that the Bills are power-rated insanely high, but the Rams are a 2.5-point underdog at home in the game where they are supposed to be celebrating their Super Bowl victory. Yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. Give me the Rams here. Uh, the Bills are good. And they're going to continue to be good. But I think the Rams win this game outright on a Thursday night. I think that this is a prime spot for them. Uh, So I will certainly, certainly ride with L.A. and Sean McVay on this one. Uh, Next one on the board, number two for me, Colts at the Texans. Texans a a 9.5 point underdog at home here. Yes, I understand that the roster does not look great. However... I don't know why the Colts would be favored by almost 10 points on the road anywhere. So, uh, the value, for me, my line on this was closer to 7. The fact that this is 9.5 uh, shows me that I've got about 2.5 points of value here. Maybe a little more. Uh, Colts 2-6 and six against the spread their last 8 against the AFC South. In division, they are not good at covering the number, period. Uh, but also, they are 3-12-1 against the spread in Week 1 games in their last 15 I mean, it goes back. It's as old as time, it feels like. The Colts don't do well in opening games. Going to continue here. Texans, by the way, 6-2 and two against the spread versus the AFC South. And part of that is because the lines get exaggerated. They just do. Like, no NFL team is that bad. Okay, they can show up. They are all professionals as well. Game number three for me. I'm going to take the Vikings plus one at home against the Packers. Yes, I understand that the Packers have Aaron Rodgers. I understand all of this. 
Uh, I know that the Vikings have uh, some questionable stuff going on. I, I know all of this. But the Vikings 27-1 and one against the spread as a home dog in their last 28. The Packers are 1-4 and four against the spread in their last five as a favorite. The Packers are 1-5 and five against the spread their last six on field turf. All of these different trends, etc. Uh, you got a new coach in Minnesota. You got all this, you know, blah, 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 blah. I like the Vikings roster. I like the Vikings team. I think they're going to be able to hang with the Packers. Not only that, I think they win the game. So the plus one is just added. So I will take the Vikings as a home dog there. Game four, the Eagles, a four-point favorite at the Lions. Now, the trends do not necessarily align with me. The Lions 4-0 and against the spread. Their last four as a home dog. However, that is, of course, once everybody realized exactly how bad they were last year. And the number got inflated. So... Uh, the Eagles 5-2-1 and one against the spread of their last eight as a favorite. That certainly bodes well. My line on this was actually the Eagles minus six. Uh, I'm getting two points of value here at minus four. I, yes, everybody's high on the Lions right now. I get it. I'm going to go the opposite way. I like the Eagles on the road here. And then finally, game five for me, Cowboys plus two and a half at home against the Bucks. Cowboys are 7-0 and against the spread as a home dog. They are 13-3, and their last 16 against the NFC. And the Buccaneers, 3-7 and against the spread as a road favorite. Again, Tom Brady inflates the line all the time, all the time. Now, sometimes he can still cover this thing, but the line gets a little bit crazy because people think a little, they expect a little bit too much. So, uh, that is who I'm riding with this week. You got Rams plus 2.5, you got Texans plus 9.5, you got Vikings plus one, Eagles minus four, and the Cowboys plus two and a half. All right, with that said, let's hit a couple of ads, and then we are headed back for the college football week two appointment viewing guide, the TV guide for college football. What are you going to watch? Let's check out some things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures, and you can follow Gary at Gary WCE. You can also follow on Facebook. Got your own podcast or web show, looking to start one, or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right, let's move into the College Football Week 2 Viewing Guide. And I'm excited about this. Uh, I think we've got some pretty interesting games going on this weekend, you you look at the slate initially, and it's, yeah, you know, you got a couple of big ones here and there, but overall, very interesting games to pay attention to. Let's go and pull it up. Uh, it's by the guys over at cfb.guide. That's, uh, you can put that in your browser and go set up your own TV schedule, so go ahead and check it out. Um, but I'm looking at this. If you look up here, you got uh, Louisville at UCF. These are the Friday games, and then Boise State at New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico looked very much improved. I still think Boise is going to smoke them, but uh, but we we shall see. Then on Saturday, you got a lot of games in that noon slate that are very interesting to me. All right, so Alabama, Texas, obviously big name brands. The game is in Austin. Game day, uh, big noon kick, whatever it is, all that stuff is going to be there. But uh, I like South Carolina at Arkansas. I want to see what those two teams are because that South Carolina offense was not great. Arkansas now has uh, some injury concerns. And, uh, you know, Arkansas was not super impressive to me in that win over Cincinnati. Uh, ESPN 2, Missouri at Kansas State. What exactly is Missouri? I know they got some superstar wide receivers. Do they have a quarterback that can get them the ball? Uh, and then Adrian Martinez uh, for Kansas State. I do want to see that. North Carolina at Georgia State is on ESPN U in the noon time slot. Uh, I think every game that North Carolina plays now is going to be must-watch. That's that's kind of what I'm thinking. And Georgia State, uh, I mean, it. they didn't, they should have covered that game against South Carolina. <laughs> I mean, they, all the special teams, snafus, all that mess. I mean, obviously, this was a very Beamer 
style of win. If you ever watched Frank Beamer, uh, his son doing the same stuff, two blocked punts, uh, you know, at field goal, all that kind of mess, right? Two 50 yard field goals. I mean, college kickers aren't supposed to do that. CBS Sports Network at noon has got UTSA, UT San Antonio heading to Army. And that one is going to be incredibly interesting. Army uh, could go to 0 2 if they lose this game. And same with UTSA. Like, these are two very interesting uh, kind of G5 teams. A 12 o'clock game. Uh, this is at 12 o'clock Central, by the way, God's time zone. You all know this. Uh, South Alabama at Central Michigan. The, these are two teams I'm very interested in from a G5 perspective. Uh, I like what Kane Womack's doing. I, I like that over at South Alabama. Uh, I'm just curious about the roster, et cetera. He's really working on stuff. He's got that defense playing really well. Uh, and then, of course, Jim McElwain's offense at Central Michigan, just rolling with Lou Nichols and Daniel Richardson. Uh, moving into the afternoon time slot, 2.30 p.m. Central Time, Tennessee at Pitt is on ABC. Now, that's awesome. That's going to be a good game. Uh, App State at Texas A&M. Like, obviously, everybody watched App State against North Carolina. Uh, I think Texas A&M, a little bit better defensively, obviously. But I'm so curious to see Haynes King again, the quarterback at Texas A&M. I want to see what he looks like. Uh, but that's on ESPN, too. Uh, again, the anxiety bowl that I mentioned earlier, CBS Sports Network. You got Memphis at Navy. Uh, that's 2.30 p.m. Central. I'm, again, very curious. What they're going to do, Memphis has not covered a single spread on the road under Ryan Silverfield. And now he goes on the road to a Navy team that just lost to Delaware last week. Just saying. Uh, you move into the 5 o'clock time slot here, and ESPN Plus has got Kansas at West Virginia. Kansas looked good in week one. And, and West Virginia did look good in a loss, but uh, I would highly recommend to Neil Brown do not lose this game to Kansas. Uh, Lance Leipold is building a culture there. He has got, uh, he's got a player at quarterback. I'm just that's going to be a fun game to watch. Um, along with that, at six o'clock, you've got Kentucky at Florida on ESPN. Yeah, of course, we talked about the suspension stuff going on at Kentucky, and we saw what Florida is capable of, especially at home at night. That's that's going to be a pretty good spot. USC at Stanford on ABC at 6.30. Uh, you know, another chance to see Lincoln Riley. Uh, if he comes out and loses this game at Stanford, <laughs> I mean, what are what in the world are we going to do? Uh, they lost to Stanford last year, and they fired Clay Hilton. No, I don't think they're going to fire Lincoln Riley. But whew, uh, Stanford, you know, looked better in game one than they did last year. They got everybody back healthy, so that is definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, at that same time, 6.30 p.m. Central Time, you've got Arizona State at Oklahoma State. This is an interesting one. Everybody wants to count out Herm Edwards, et cetera, and, and maybe this thing falls apart on them. Maybe it does. Oklahoma State, though, week one, man, they got the Gundy ball back. They are moving fast. They are throwing the ball around. Spencer Sanders looked good. I think he's better than Emory Jones, who is the quarterback, of course, transferred from Florida over to Arizona State. But uh, but Arizona State's got Xavier and Valade, like all these different kind of things. So, you know, we'll we'll see about that one. I think it could get interesting. You move ahead about 30 more minutes. You got Boston College at Virginia Tech. That's a 7 p.m. Central Time kick. Uh, and that's on the ACC Network. Uh, two teams that started 0-1 that both expected to be 1-0. How much anxiety will there be for this one? Uh, I don't think Brent Pry's got anything to worry about. Obviously, he's in year one. Jeff Halfley, um, you keep losing games like like to Rutgers and stuff, uh, you might be in trouble, especially when you got like a a sneaky NFL draft pick kind of kind of quarterback there uh, with Phil Dracovich. But ooh, just rough. And then finally, the nightcap. I mean, it's going to be awesome, just awesome. Baylor at BYU. That's a really really good game. Um, that's on ESPN 9:15 p.m. Then at 9:30, you've got Oregon State. At Fresno State, uh, the Beavers looked good last week. And, of course, you got Jeff Tedford, the uh, the head coach at Fresno State, Jake Hayner doing his thing. I mean, he beat he beat a Pac-12 team last year. Now he gets one at home. We'll see. Uh, Mississippi State at Arizona is the full nightcap, the 10 p.m. I mean, that is peak Pac-12 after dark with Mike Leach going to uh, face Jaden DeLora and uh, – uh, good gracious, uh, Arizona, Jacob Cowling. So, Arizona looked good week one against San Diego State. Uh, probably a lot of points there, I would imagine. Uh, and, you know, wacky stuff is going to happen 
in a game because my gosh, it's a 10 p.m. kick in uh, in Tucson. Like, let's go, let's go. All right, uh, that is going to wrap things up for today's show. You guys have been fantastic. Thank you for continuing to support the show. I had told you all beforehand uh, to download the podcast because we're going to, you know, the Tuesday show would only be on the podcast, etc. And not the case. Not the case. We we're just going to keep everything rolling. Uh, we got we got sponsors. We got things that we got to work on. We're going to put it all on YouTube, and it's all going to be on the podcast as well. Everything will be out there, easy to find, easy to get to. So. Subscribe where you can subscribe, on YouTube or on the podcast, whatever your favorite podcast app is, Spotify, Apple, etc. Go ahead and check it out. Uh, that's the best thing for me. <laughs> and uh, and like the video. You know, jump in the chat, jump in the comments. I'd love to hear your opinions on these topics, on all these different things. Is there a game that I need to be watching on Saturday that I didn't go over in the guide? Toss it in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. All right, with that said, uh, don't forget the show is powered by BetUS. That is where the game begins. It is America's premier online sports book. Been doing this for damn near three decades. Go ahead and give them a visit. There is a link in the description, betus.com. And make sure and sign up for the contest over at winningcureseverything.com. $25 Amazon gift card every single week. And on top of that, just going to throw tossing this out there, BetUS is either doing a free play, and that we're talking money, <laughs> or they are going to do uh, a jersey of the team of your choice. Reach out to me for more, at GaryWCE on Twitter. All right, that's going to wrap this thing up. You guys have been awesome. Uh, Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully, hopefully, all you tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.